Welcome, everyone. I think we're going to try to get started. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. No? Is it working any better now? Good. Okay. All right. So, terrific to see so many of you here um, this afternoon. And on a beautiful spring afternoon, one of the first lovely sunny days we've had in a while, I think it's a real testimonial to the importance of this issue that so many people are here today to hear Ambassador Dobriansky uh, speak. Um, before we move on uh, to our guest speaker, I want to say a word or two and about an event that we're going to have here at CSIS next Tuesday at 10 a.m. that we hope many of you will be able to come to, and that is going to be the launch of the CSIS Commission on Smart Global Health Policy. Uh, the commission is comprised of 23 extremely accomplished individuals from the global health community, but also from many other walks of life. Uh, we have individuals who are leaders in the private sector, in the philanthropic world, uh, information technology, uh, finance, media, um, former and current members of Congress, as well as leaders from the foreign policy and security communities, who are coming together to form this commission, which between now and the end of the year, is going to examine U.S. health investments to date and to look ahead at to how these investments can best be leveraged in the future, producing a report by the end of this year, which we hope will be of use um, to the administration as it looks ahead in the next five years, the next ten years, planning really what the U.S. should do to build upon the very important successful initiatives that have already been put in place. I believe there's some information in the back about our, um, our schedule events for next Tuesday. We'll have opening remarks from our two co-chairs, uh, Helene Gale, who's the President and CEO of CARE, and um, Admiral William Fallon, who uh, is the retired former commander of the Central Command and the Pacific Command. We'll also have an address from one of our members of Congress, Congressman Keith Ellison, as well as two uh, roundtable discussions. So please, if you're able to join us, we'd really be very delighted uh, to have you with us. Uh, now, turning to today's topic, uh, Afghanistan is a country that's been in turmoil for more than three decades. Uh, no one has suffered more during that period than the country's women. Uh, the statistics tell the story and are quite sobering. Uh, female life expectancy at birth is 43 years. Almost 54 percent of all Afghan girls are married before their 18th birthday. One in eight Afghan women will die giving birth and only 12 percent of Afghans women are literate. Uh, just in the last few days, I think we've all probably seen the very courageous effort by a group of women in Kabul to protest a law that threatened uh, very fundamentally some of their most basic human rights. Um, and on a positive note, I think there's now been some commitment uh, to turn back that proposed uh, legislation. We're very, import very uh, fortunate to have with us today someone who not only cares deeply about Afghan women, but has translated that concern into action, uh, affecting change on the ground and mobilizing resources to make things better. Uh, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky uh, served as Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs from May 2001 to January 2009. She was responsible for a broad range of foreign policy issues, including democracy, human rights, labor, refugee and humanitarian affairs, and environmental and science issues. Presently, she is a senior fellow at Harvard University's School of Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and is a senior international affairs and trade advisor at the law firm of Baker Hostetler. Uh, Dr. Dobriansky has also served as a senior vice president and director of the Washington Office of the Council of Foreign Relations, and her prior government appointments include positions as associate director for policy and programs at the United States Information Agency and deputy assistant secretary of state for human rights and humanitarian affairs. Uh, on a personal note, I need to add that I had the real pleasure of uh, working for um, Paula from 2001 to 2002 at a time when we were um, staffing up and she was directing a task force on Afghan humanitarian issues. And I can attest to the fact um, that uh, her achievements in her resume are all exactly as described, um, but more importantly, in addition to that, she's a, a wonderful colleague and a terrific mentor. So thank you for joining us today, Paula.
Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much, Elisa, for that very warm introduction. And let me just say that uh, the center here is very lucky to have uh, Lisa. Uh, we were very sorry when she left us at the department uh, in her first uh, departure, but it's very fitting in, uh, today, and I'm, I'm really honored that she's introducing me because she was very pivotally involved in the development uh, and the implementation of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. So, and not only in terms of uh, the other issues that you had mentioned. I also would like to congratulate uh, Steve uh, Morrison, who's uh, back there, um, uh, to really a very vibrant uh, program here focused on such a broad range of global health issues. Um, I have to say, from having come out of the State Department, one thing that I'm very heartened by is, is that this issue, the issue of health as a national security issue, is very much integrated uh, into the work of the department, uh, into the work in, of a foreign policy uh, track. And I think that what you have done over the years uh, here at uh, CSIS and the development of the center has had really a very direct impact on that. So really, uh, thank you and also your team. I am very heartened by the fact that given the beautiful weather outside, that um, uh, those of you who are here this afternoon really thank you for, for coming. I would like to um, divide my presentation up into a number of parts. Uh, I would like to first just talk about uh, a little bit about what the situation had been in Afghanistan um, up to 2001 and then to look at the kinds of statistical changes that have taken place, to talk thirdly about a number of programs, and then the next steps. Let me just start with, as, as we know, um, in fact, uh, at the time when the U.S. Afghan Women's Council was launched, it was launched by Presidents Bush and Presidents, uh, Presidents Bush and Karzai in January of 2002. Uh, at that time, um, it was striking to us, the Afghan women were very precise in terms of what agenda they not only wanted at council, but by the way, anyone interacting with them um, to focus on. Uh, uh, the area of education was a very significant, important one, it was one of their priorities. The area of economic empowerment, uh, secondly, Thirdly, certainly the area of health. Um, fourthly, the issue of rights, uh, legal uh, uh, rights, uh, political empowerment, if you will. And then also let me mention another area that uh, came a little bit later, but it's integrated into all of these, and that is looking at the next generation, about the welfare of, of children in Afghanistan. So they were very precise in saying these are the issues that matter. I was very struck by the fact that health was definitely one of the priority areas. And clearly, Afghan women uh, understood and understand um, that not only their children, their communities, but the welfare of their nation at large will be affected if, in fact, health issues are not addressed. And better access to health care, uh, not just only in the cities, but throughout Afghanistan, will in fact matter. So, I have to say that access to health services is improving. It's improving overall through the training of a new health care personnel. And under five, mortality is decreasing, as quality of services delivered is in fact improving, and immunization rates rise. But let's uh, look at, very specifically, what are the conditions before and where is it, uh, in fact, now. Um, before, uh, in looking at in 2001, and this is overall only 9% of the population had access to basic health care, men, women, children. 42% of child deaths were from preventable diseases. One out of every four children died before their fifth birthday. And the maternal mortality ratio was the second highest in the world at 1,600 deaths for every 100,000 live births. 
an Afghanistan with limited, minimal government capacity, obviously spa has faced a very special and very tough challenge to build its national systems and its institutions and infrastructure to be able to provide um, uh, health, quick health improvements and access to all Afghans. Looking at now, what are the statistics? The statistics basically have changed in many ways and I think uh, very much uh, 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 an improvement, but there's a ways to go. 82, and this is by the end of 2008, 82% of the population now has access to basic services. There has been a 22% drop in the number of children that die before their first birthday. National immunization coverage of children under one year of age has increased from 31% in 2000 to 77 percent in 2006. Tuberculosis cases fell by 60 percent thanks to a tripling uh, of the number of treatment facilities and the massive immunization campaigns on the ground. UNICEF has played a significant role and there are others in this regard. Uh, and more than 90% of all children now Im are now immunized against uh, polio, another important uh, uh, statistic. Um, I, I cite these for you because I think it's noteworthy that even at a really what constitutes a challenging time for Afghanistan in its own evolution, that there has been uh, a focus in terms of improvement in this area that's been undertaken by uh, the Ministry of Public Health. It has been in a very targeted way assisted by many interlocutors in the U.S. government, not only the Department of State, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control, among others, and by the private sector many institutions that have given up their time and have made a very strong commitment of being on the ground and really helping the Afghans uh, build uh, capacity. I want to also just mention to you USAID, I have up front here from our colleagues uh, at the United States Agency for International Development, a one-pager that basically in a nutshell gives you what it was in 2001 and what has changed and the statistics. So for those of you, you've taken notes, but if you'd like to have this, these are up here on the table and I think uh, is a very good um, uh, summary of the kind of progress that has been made. Having said that, let's go to um, a, a third set of, of issues. That's the before and where we are now. What are the key areas that really matter in terms of advancing health care, health care services in Afghanistan. Because you have to at first ask, why is it that um, uh, this happened in the first place? Well, one of the fundamental reasons is you have a country that has been ravaged by war and conflict for decades. Secondly, because in that context, then you don't have a, and didn't have on the ground access to health care workers uh, in uh, many of the main cities and throughout the rural areas. Thirdly, as Lisa cited at the outset, you have a high rate of illiteracy. So even if you don't have access to health care workers, then there's the challenge of being able to read through, uh, enhance your knowledge base about health-related issues. So that is also a third problem. Fourthly is institutions that were crippled and literally demolished during the years of conflict. So you don't have an agenda or a blueprint for action that had been able to be put together. And then you go into a fifth area, that is Afghanistan has been isolated um, over the years uh, geographically uh, because of the circumstances on the ground. And then, no less, the issue of um, uh, uh, the circumstances uh, and the cultural issues on the ground in this case, meaning specifically 
um, uh, during the time of the uh, Taliban, when you look at that, uh, the issue of how a woman would get access to health care services. Uh, she would have to be accompanied by her husband, uh, by uh, a male member of the family, what have you. Um, so that kind of ready access um, for needs that uh, were imperative. So looking at that, what are the fundamental areas that have been addressed and are being addressed? I mentioned to you the Ministry of Public Health, and I want to commend uh, the Minister of Public Health, uh, the one who has, is in place now and who has been in place for a good number of years, uh, Dr. Fatemi, um, who I will never forget our first meeting of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council with him. It was an extremely substantive meeting. It was one that was extremely action-oriented. It was where he was telling us quite directly, these are the areas that we plan to target. These are the areas that we need assistance in. And this is how we plan to go forward. I have to say that not only for myself, but other members, both governmental and non-governmental members of the council were very impressed with his focus, with his um, uh, very uh, uh, enthusiastic um, uh, demeanor, and looking at where things have been and where they are, I have to say I think that his leadership has contributed quite significantly, uh, in fact, to, um, uh, to that effort. Here, I'd like to mention that a first objective, an objective of all the stakeholders, uh, not only the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, but government uh, and NGOs all at large has to be is how to build capacity to create greater Afghan ownership. Because what is important here is sustainability, is you know, inculcating uh, standards, uh, having guidelines, having also um, um, networks that are established that are going to sustain and empower the Afghans to move forward regardless of whether there are ebbs and flows of you know, groups that come and maybe go out of Afghanistan. That kind of capacity is important. It's important to strengthen human resources capacity. It's important to have a focus on training, to have a reservoir of those health care workers who are able to go out to rural areas and to help uh, rural communities, particularly in the area of, um, uh, of uh, uh, the issue of uh, tackling maternal mortality. Here, it's been very important in terms of the midwifery programs. And I'm going to say a bit more about programs uh, a little bit later. But in this area, it's important that there is support for health care workers those dealing not only with uh, 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 the issue of, um, of uh, overall training, midwifery, um, but also uh, the area uh, of diseases that are related specifically to uh, children. So that was the first area and which is absolutely essential for all stakeholders to embrace. A second is one that I've referenced and it has been very much part of uh, the U.S. government's efforts. Uh, it's a, uh, a priority of uh, assistance through USAID, among others, and that is creating health care standards. I mentioned that before, that's critical, and that was and is an area that the Minister of Public Health has placed a premium on. You have to have that in order to build capacity throughout Afghanistan and not just only in, um, in the um, uh, cities. Here, I think quite significantly is that there are packages that have been assembled um, and there are, in fact, uh, two standardized health care packages, the basic package of health services and the essential package of hospital services that have been assembled in Afghanistan and in fact, which the Ministry of Public Health has collaborated with uh, USAID, with CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, among others. Again, that is absolutely 
critical not only for those operating, but also, bluntly speaking, even for building uh, an increasing public trust in, uh, in Afghanistan uh, in government services. The third area is naturally financial support. Um, I'm stating uh, certainly the obvious here uh, that uh, 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 clearly uh, financial support is necessary Although there has been this improvement from 2001 to 2008, now 2009, there's a lot of work that remains certainly to be done, um, uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. So in this area, it's absolutely essential. Um, I understand that, and I'm going to cite this, and I believe it's also in the, in the um, um, uh, material uh, from USAID, um, that in terms of the, there are 13 provinces that in fact have been targeted um, uh, for health funding uh, uh, through the Afghan Ministry of Public Health over the next five years, and it's some $236 million to help manage the delivery of those two programs that I've mentioned uh, to some 5 point, excuse me, 8.5 million people. Again, that's important, it's significant, and I really um, uh, wanted to highlight that. Now let me uh, transition a little bit and to say a bit more specifically about the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. I wanted to give a broader picture at first, as I've mentioned, about the past, about the present, about some of the broader objectives, but I want to talk a bit about some of the targeted work of the Council. and. Uh, what it has been sh uh, seeking to uh, achieve here. Um, there had been a number of health-related uh, programs that were very much driven by not only Dr. Fatimi, uh, relevant to the Council, but also by the Afghan women participants, the Afghan women's uh, minister, um, uh, and all of them were focused on this, um, uh, starting with Seema Samar, and then Masuda Jalal, um, uh, Habiba uh, Sharabi, uh, and then no less up to the present uh, uh, minister. All of them placed uh, uh, a priority on uh, a midwifery program. So the U.S. Afghan Women's Council felt it was important to try to support, in addition to work that was being done, assistance in this area. And let me just step back and say this for those of you who may know and some who may not know. The Council is a public-private partnership. Um, it was housed in the State Department in the Office of um, uh, Global uh, Women's Issues. In fact, one of its previous directors is here today, uh, Charlie uh, Ponticelli. And um, uh, at the end of the administration, it went over to Georgetown University. And there, Dr. Phyllis Magreb, um, who um, uh, is the head of the Child uh, uh, Support and Development Health um, uh, Center at Georgetown, is its vice chair, and Jack DeJoya, the president of Georgetown University, is one of its co-chairs, along with the Minister of, of Women's Issues and also the Foreign Minister. Um, uh, and let me mention, in fact, Ambassador Steve Steiner, who's here today, um, uh, who is in uh, Ambassador Milan Verveer's office at the State Department, which is uh, the Office of Global Women's Issues, um, uh, as designated by Secretary of State uh, Clinton, um, has uh, responsibility, in fact, for, um, uh, for um, uh, this area. So uh, you have the base in Georgetown University, but you have a tie into uh, the U.S. government, and in this case being the State Department. And I, I just want to say also we're very appreciative of the fact that not only Secretary Clinton, but also Ambassador Verveer are strong supporters of uh, the work of the Council uh, in all its areas, no less in this area. Let me come, with that backdrop, let me come to the midwifery program. One of the um, areas um, uh, focused on is uh, uh, the what's known as the REACH project, Rural Expansion of Community-Based Health Care. 
It basically trained Afghan women to become midwives and community health workers. And in addition to this training, the program also took measures to prevent um, uh, 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 different kinds of, take action to prevent different kinds of uh, illnesses through immunization programs like polio, tetanus, malaria. It provided educational health information and also improved health services related to postpartum uh, hemorrhage. The program reached 12 provinces, and uh, in fact, um, uh, the program ended in 2006. Specifically, they had trained actually some 65% of all of the midwives in Afghanistan. So you had more than 3,300 community health workers. Um, we were very lucky. We met, in fact, in 2004, the first graduating class of that program, actually at the uh, Malalai Hospital in uh, Kabul. Let me mention a second. A second is, is the Women's Teacher Training Institute. I mentioned education. There's a direct correlation between education and an understanding of health issues. Here, in fact, um, uh, as launched by USAID, there's a Learning for Life program. The Learning for Life program, it's an accelerated health program focused on literacy about basic health care and also bolstering uh, the cadre of health workers in rural areas. Here, there was synergy between what USAID was doing and also the contributions of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council because there was a link between the Women's Teacher Training Institute actually, and this particular program, Learning for Life, which, as the focus of the Women's Teacher Training Institute, was to train um, educators in literacy and to literally dispatch them out uh, throughout Afghanistan, they would be able, at the same time, not only be able to enhance the literacy level, but at the same time, to also be able to um, uh, provide assistance and information in this area. So there was a great deal of, uh, of, of synergy in this area. I want to mention a third area, and that is of burn victims. Um, uh, there have been many young women especially affected uh, in, this, in, the, in this regard. I know that you've read uh, articles and stories about uh, young women whose faces have been burned uh, for uh, uh, reasons uh, that uh, defy uh, 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 truly uh, any uh, rationale and reason. Um, you have many burn victims, uh, women, children, and here there were two programs that I especially want to mention uh, that really, I think, underscore uh, the, the nature of giving in our own country, where uh, basic American citizens came forward. They had no ties to Afghanistan, no ties, but were very desirous of helping and sharing their capabilities and assistance in this area in order to help burn victims in and throughout Afghanistan. The first is, is uh, what's known as Tri-West Medical Alliance in which the council teamed up with Tri-West Medical Alliance, in fact, to bring uh, burn victims and a, an awareness program, uh, in fact, there. Um, there were three target provinces of Kabul, Nangarhar, and Herat, and over five million Afghans directively re directly received burn prevention training through district-level training, school trainings, and patient education. They also provided, in fact, um, uh, not only materials, but they also, uh, in this case, provided um, uh, access to radios, television. They started a program in which they were broadcasting into some areas that were very difficult to, to get to. And in fact, there were radio and television public service announcements that they were able to broadcast. Uh, this year, the program is expanding into Parwan, Langman, and Logar provinces. The other one is the Grossman Burn Center at Sherman Oaks Hospital in California. Here you have two individuals 
um, Peter and uh, Rebecca uh, Grossman, who basically uh, reached out and have very actively brought burn victims to the United States for treatment. Um, uh, there have been many who have come to California and specifically to the um, facility there for treatment. They also are now establishing a facility on the ground in Kabul with the goal of also providing training. I mention these to you because uh, it was very striking and very heartening to me as being a former government official and actually um, uh, being approached by American citizens who, as I said, uh, in cases just as individuals came forward and really wanted to contribute and to help to the growth and um, uh, the advancement of Afghanistan. I want to mention finally, yesterday there was, I felt, an important meeting that was convened at Georgetown University. Uh, Dr. Maghreb, um, Maghreb uh, uh, chaired the first U.S.-Afghan Women's Council meeting at Georgetown with a focus on the issue of health. Um, she identified that one of their goals and objectives, in fact, is to strive to um, uh, establish a broad network, uh, and a network among uh, a wide variety of not only um, uh, non-governmental, but also to inform our U.S. government and to share um, uh, in the, this collaborative effort in a public-private partnership. I mention it because of two reasons. First, it was striking to me hearing uh, yesterday a bit about the Abbott Fund. And I don't know if there are any representatives of Abbott here in the, in the uh, room, but um, uh, they made a very uh, compelling presentation about improving maternal and child health in Afghanistan. Um, they have been on the ground um, there uh, since, I believe, uh, from this fact sheet since November of 2005. And from what I've read, they're really doing quite significant work in terms of providing for vaccinations, nutritional um, uh, assessments and health, health, health workshops. But what was significant is, and that I'm very heartened by, and it's the second point, is that at the meeting yesterday, it's very clear that one of the key agendas will be to expand the kind of alliance that exists as part of the Council and to ensure that there are strong collaborative efforts. They're comparing notes as to areas that are being addressed, what areas aren't being addressed, and how, as a strong alliance, they can go forward and really make a further difference on the ground. Um, uh, I was also uh, very heartened uh, uh, by the fact uh, that uh, you had a combination, as I said, of both governmental and non-governmental participants yesterday, and that really underscores the whole spirit of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. So with that, let me just say, uh, before we open it up for comments and questions, um, this area is an area that is a priority not only for uh, Afghan women, uh, but for Afghans. Uh, it is a priority for the United States, uh, I think publicly and privately. I think thirdly, what has uh, been significant here is a focused agenda and having also interlocutors in the public, in the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, that also have been terrific partners and have made a difference, and uh, a mutual goal and objective of sustainable approaches, of how you can make a difference for the long term, not just for the short term. And finally, let me just say that uh, uh, Lisa uh, began in introducing me by mentioning the events of the recent days, and I have to say that the Afghan women have always demonstrated a great deal of, I think, courage, and uh, I have seen time and again in whatever area we talk about just tremendous steadfast, steadfastness, leadership, and commitment on their part. And it's certainly something that has motivated those of us that are very, very committed to these issues, knowing that we have such strong partners there. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions and comments.
so we have we have time for questions, um, but I'll have to say I can't resist maybe uh, taking the prerogative of the chair and posing the first one myself. So if you'll excuse me, um, Paula, you know one one thing that I think uh, in many different geographic settings we've learned in the area of women's health is that men have to be a very important part of the picture in terms of improving attitudes and access and just the whole surrounding set of um, pieces that need to be a part of the puzzle so that women can get the care that they need. Um, if, if one looks at the news broadcasts from Kabul of last week with these courageous women coming forward but um, meeting with a very negative and violent reaction, one has sort of a disturbing um, impression of, of, of the, uh, the, the possible or the potential to shift men's attitudes. Um, you've been now involved for more than eight years. Uh, what, what is your take? What, what can happen, what can be done, what kinds of things can um, outside partners support that can help shift those attitudes a bit? Okay, I think that's an excellent question. Let me um, uh, first start with uh, the fact, if I can, of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, as I mentioned. You have not only, uh, 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 in this case, will formally uh, 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 an undersecretary for democracy and global affairs, but now a president of a university and also a vice chair. So you have um, uh, uh, Dr. Dejoya at the same time, Dr. Maghreb. But you have on the Afghan side uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister Spanta. And then at the same time, you have the Minister of Women's Affairs. I'll start with that because in terms of the running of such an entity, it was, I think, very important in having uh, the involvement not only of Afghan women, but Afghan men. And uh, I will give an example where the previous foreign minister and the current foreign minister had uh, uh, a foreign minister Abdullah Abdullah and now foreign minister Spanta had, uh, I think, an important impact. Uh, one of the proposals made by the council was to enhance the number of women in uh, the diplomatic uh, corps and uh, to uh, appoint ambassadors, because there had not been heretofore women ambassadors uh, in different, uh, close to in different countries. Um, there have been a number. I'll say I hope that it will increase more, but uh, it had an impact, uh, a direct impact in that sense. Okay, second, moving more broadly. Uh, in terms of programs and initiatives, in fact, it was very, I think, important that Afghan women themselves have said how important it is to involve um, uh, men. The training program at the Women's Teacher Training Institute, by the way, is both for men and women. We had uh, the benefit of going, seeing it, and why? because the way in which their educational system is structured in terms of courses for young boys and courses for young, uh, young girls. Um, here, we witnessed a collaborative effort uh, and in which you had young uh, men dispatched to rural areas and young women. You want to have literacy elevated at all levels. Thirdly, and importantly, many of them had, uh, when I say many, many Afghan uh, women had suggested and proposed that it was important having resource centers and community centers in different localities. And as part of that, to reach out to the mullahs and to, in fact, have their involvement in uh, a variety of uh, uh, discussions. Some of them initiated some, you know, kind of, of discourse and found that that kind of, of support was important. Things like immunization programs and literally having them systematized and having an outreach to an entire community, that kind of engagement through a community center and through, for example, um, uh, uh, the uh, mullahs, I think has had an important uh, impact. Coming back to your point uh, and about what's happened on the ground, um, that represents uh, some but that does not represent all. And I think uh, what uh, it should say to all of us that it's necessary to look at ways of bridging differences. Uh, there may be some whose minds may not change, 
But I think there will also be some whose minds, you know, will evolve or are interested in looking at the benefit of all and how to go forward in a uh, thoughtful way. Um, I want to also remind that you do have women in parliament. Uh, the women of Afghanistan chose to have um, a, a number of seats and by law they have a percentage of seats in both the upper house and the lower house and um, uh, many of them are very politically active. They've come here to the United States, they've gone to other countries and they're networking. So there too, they know that as politicians, that not only in their own communities, but they have to have build coalitions. So that's another area in which many of them are very focused on. Building coalitions with other male legislator, legislators in areas that will matter uh, to uh, their welfare. Um, open the floor to questions, and I think what we'll do is take questions in groups of three, and I'd ask you please to um, identify yourself. Um, please. Okay. My name is Nazira Azim Karimi. I'm correspondent in Ariana Television from Afghanistan, and I'm from Afghanistan too. You know, I know about uh, women in Afghanistan situation. Also, you mention a lot of progress in Afghanistan. But still, they have a lot of problems, especially the Taliban. They get more power day by day. And this is a big issue for them to prevent them to even they care about their health and everything. And also, uh, civilian casualty. This is the other problem. And also, most of them, they have a mental problem. And you mentioned that some women came for treatment to California. Uh, there is any other program for the people or the women who have a mental problem? and they continue this pro program for them. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your comment and then question. First, let me say one of the messages that I did end on, and I hope I was clear, I wanted to share what has changed because uh, uh, when you look at the statistics in 2001 and then where it is now, I think it's important, the progress that has been made. But my last comment was specifically that uh, there's a ways to go, and we have much work before us to do. Uh, there are many challenges in many sectors relevant to health that exist. I think there's especially a strong desire to achieve much, much more in outlying uh, provinces and areas that maybe have not gotten as much assistance uh, here to, uh, to uh, for. On the issue of mental health, I'm really glad you raised that because, you know, as I looked around the room and I was thinking, all of you, you know, it's a little bit warm in here and, and I'm speaking to you and I had more examples to give. It was one of the examples I was going to mention because actually uh, we very much appreciated Zora Rosek, who was uh, Charlie Ponticelli's uh, interlocutor. She headed, in fact, and I believe still does, the women's office in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, she raised this as a priority issue at one of our first U.S.-Afghan uh, uh, council meetings. She said that it's absolutely essential. You can't imagine how many uh, people in and throughout Afghanistan, men, women, children, that their, their, their state of their mental health has been affected by uh, years of, of, of war, conflict, and how to deal with it. And I will tell you, it's a topic that not only we have discussed uh, significantly, but also one in which we have tried to put them in touch with those individuals who are experts in this area and how they could specifically address this area. I know it's one that I'm pointing to Charlie. I know it's one that uh, you spent time with because it was a priority uh, for her. And, and uh, uh, it was not only uh, for her individually, but it was one that was mentioned quite often. Um, let me just say that on this, it's been part of very much the uh, issues addressed of the council. We have put them in touch with different interlocutors. But I will say, and I'm not a doctor in a medical sense, but from the doctors that they'll say this takes time. You know, it's not something that's going to um, change overnight. 
Um, and I don't know if, and forgive me, I don't know if you'd like to comment a little bit on this, but you, you did spend uh, time with uh, Zora on this, if I may. Uh, call on, a, uh, on an, someone from the audience. <laughs> I did have the chance, actually, uh, to get together with Zora Rasek. Uh, she was my counterpart um, when I was working for Paula on the Afghan women's issues. So I, I had lunch with her just about two weeks ago. She's continuing to work on this issue and continuing to build the partnerships that Paula mentioned. And let me just say that uh, as Paula was speaking, and she mentioned some of the really high-profile partnership initiatives uh, that have been launched under her leadership and her role at the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. But there are many others that really didn't get uh, the headlines. And as Paula was talking, I was thinking in particular of one group of women from Kentucky that I spoke to. I was asked at the last minute to speak to a visiting group of women. And unbeknownst to me, there was a woman in that group of about 30 women who's a dentist and she went back to Kentucky and mobilized a group of uh, dentists and doctors. And they went to Afghanistan, set up a temporary clinic, and in the space of, I think it was two weeks, treated about 2,000 patients. Uh, no headlines, very little attention to that. There's also a small group based in Baltimore called Afghans for Civil Society. Pat Karzai runs that. Uh, one of the nurses, uh, Baltimore-based, that she works with, Ellen, I forget her last name, but she went over to Afghanistan with a couple of boxes of the rubber syringes to, to uh, help clean the babies after they're born because there were thousands of children who were dying before that. Uh, if they were born without breathing, the doctors and midwives didn't know what to do, so they would lay the children on the floor, and most of them would die. And now with just basic, basic instruction and with very rudimentary uh, implements uh, children uh, are living. Uh, so I think there are just uh, some incredible partnerships. The psychosocial trauma, Zora has told us very forcefully, will be the problem for the coming generation. And it will take time, as Paula said. But I think that we need to continue to look at partnership and creative solutions. I know that there's a lot that's being done through telemedicine now. And I think that there's a bigger role that technology could play. But I think it's an excellent point you made. Thank, thank you very much for those additions. I make two fast footnotes because we have other hands. Um, I just want to underscore by Charlie mentioning that, it, it really does underscore one thing that truly was heartening for me, as I said, as an undersecretary, was the outpouring of support from in and throughout the United States, whether people had a connection to Afghanistan or not. And one of the things that also evolved, which I think is terrific, is the State Department has a gift fund in this area. And why? Because there were people who said, we want to support, but we don't know who, who or where or how to contribute. And uh, uh, I think that has provided a very good mechanism for those that are undecided or don't know who to go to. And as Afghanistan itself is solidifying its own NGO and, you know, operations, because uh, 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 what you'd want is resources to go directly in. Um, uh, during this time, um, uh, it's been, a, I think, a good avenue for garnering those types of assistance and then directing it forward into Afghanistan during this transitional period. Maybe we take three questions together. Okay, so sure, sure. So um, there was a gentleman in the center here. Thank you very much. My name is Metab Karim, and I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh, I have been a professor and head of the Protective Health Program at Aga Khan University in Karachi for the last 10 years. Currently, I'm working on a book on uh, world Muslim demographics. I'm based here in Washington. Uh, you have given some really nice statistics about Afghanistan, about which most of us are familiar with. But, uh, and you did mention about three areas in which women have come forward political participation, uh, education, and health. And uh, I don't know why you omitted one area which is very important is uh, birth control, family planning. And I'll just give you some very interesting statistics. Uh, Iran, next door to Afghanistan, has average number of children per woman, two. In Uzbekistan, in the north, is three. In Pakistan, in the east, is, uh, is four. 
in Afghanistan is more than six. And it is directly related to the percentage of women who are using birth control from 70% in Iran to about 55 in Uzbekistan to 30% in Pakistan. And we have very limited statistics on this uh, issue in Afghanistan. A lot of students of mine who were from Afghanistan working, doing their degrees at Aga Khan University did their thesis with me. And it's barely 10% of women are using birth control. Of course, one area which has already been mentioned that uh, men are opposed to it. There's very little participation and support of men, including politicians, to family planning in Afghanistan. And I think that's an area which really needs to be looked at because maternal mortality, infant child mortality, they're all related to having to meet the different things. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll comment and after the yes. three. Yeah. There is Thank a, you. over here in the back. Hi, Ambassador. I'm uh, Gene Von Ventry. I'm a uh, former DOD, and I'm helping CSIS to look at uh, uh, national security and global health issues. I mm -hmm. wanted to get your impression. What, what is the role or what ought to be the role of health issues, and specifically women's health issues, in what Ambassador Holbrook is trying to accomplish in Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan? In other words, is there a role for health diplomacy in that sort of work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, the, the lady in the back row, if she still wants to ask a question. Given the evident success of the global array of outsourced professional services to Afghanistan under your leadership and others, and the evident growth of women's attention there, some mandated, some, uh, if you will, subversive, what is the status of indigenous development of a full array of formal medical education as medical schools in Afghanistan, and specifically what roles are women playing in achieving that status? Okay. Should I go ahead with this? Three? Okay. All right. Um, on the first, um, thank you so much for your comments, uh, sir, uh, uh, concerning family planning. Um, you're right, I, I, I didn't, in fact, I'm looking here, there are a number of things I didn't mention, and let me give as an example, by the way, uh, you know, I was citing the work, for example, of the Abbott Fund. Um, they cite, and let me give a statistic, they said that just from their work alone, and this is now not others taking into a statistic, but there are some 58,000 women that have received reproductive health uh, services. Um, they also talk about, uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, the kinds of clinics that they have held relative to family planning. I will just simply say uh, to you that, uh, yes, uh, that is uh, uh, an important component. Uh, all of these uh, matter uh, in terms of dealing with maternal mortality. Um, uh, and it is one that a number of stakeholders already operating in Afghanistan, in fact, are doing so. Um, on the second uh, question, uh, the gentleman fr formerly from, uh, you said DOD and now here at CSIS, uh, my answer is immediately yes. Uh, um, I know the focus is on the issue of uh, enhancing uh, the coalition uh, and the troops, uh, number of troops into Afghanistan. Um, I know also, secondly, there is a discussion and a debate going on uh, outside in the foreign policy community about uh, what uh, one should do uh, beyond the enhancement of, of, of troops. I personally come down very strongly on the side of uh, continued assistance to Afghanistan in areas that it needs assistance so that it can solidify itself, its foundation, um, that it can also, through areas like this, which do matter to peace and stability uh, and the welfare of a community. So um, as I began with all of you, I mentioned how health, I see it as a national security issue. It's one that uh, matters. I, I believe here that it has to be part of an overall integrative strategy vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, Afghanistan. 
not just solely, you know, military. Um, thirdly, uh, also, all three of these are excellent uh, comments and questions. Um, yours uh, is a very good one. I will tell you, I don't know the statistics offhand, but I will say that I don't think it's very sizable. I do know that there are some women who are doctors. In fact, we even met a number <laughs> of them. But I will tell you, I don't know the statistics on this, uh, except to say that uh, my impression is the number is, is, is small. Uh, but the ones that have achieved a status of doctors, um, uh, in fact, there was one former minister who was quite well known, uh, actually, um, uh, uh, who uh, actually I think is like one of the most uh, renowned uh, doctors in Afghanistan, happens to be a woman. Um, but you don't have many on that track. And let me come to a second comment. I did have the benefit of last fall going and meeting with young students from the universities. And again, this is a subjective comment when I've asked the young women, you know, what is it that you want to be? What is it you want to do? Um, most of them were looking at political tracks <laughs> for themselves. Um, interestingly enough, this was not an area that I heard many of them say, well, I want to be a doctor. And that's, you know, uh, the path that I'm going to go on. So you do raise a very important point, and actually, in addition to the gentleman, the first comment, your comment, and, and even the, the third, all of these matter in terms of how we go forward and areas that, um, uh, uh, to help Afghanistan, you know, uh, family planning matters. It matters in terms of how it fits in our overall strategy, and it certainly matters in terms of the kind of education uh, and direction. Right now, though, uh, as I said, it may be a subjective comment on my part, but just from listening to the young women, uh, most um, uh, don't seem to be going in that direction. Please, the gentleman. That's all. Are we going to take three or four we'll again? Take three. Okay. I am Dr. Tajuddin Milatmal. I just came from Afghanistan. I'm an MD, and I was the ex-president uh, of the Afghan Medical Professional Association in America. Uh, there are a lot I would like to share, and I would like your uh, specific attention to a few things. First of all, thanks for encouraging us that things are going very well in Afghanistan, and thanks for admiring what's happened best. But let me share with you some things which is probably very, very painful, and we need to understand. First of all, I believe we, the Americans, we are very naive understanding Afghanistan. People are just telling us over there what we want to hear. That's not what reality is. I travel throughout Afghanistan. I do, I'm doing social research now. Well, that's not my field. That's why I shouldn't be doing. I should be doing medical services, which I really want to do. But in reality, actually, everything is closed for people who want to do some things. As the president of the Afghan Medical Association, we tried as hard as we can do to get there and to assist the Afghan people, the whole entire medical association. We were blocked. Fatimi is a good friend of mine. I, he, he was senior in college for me. He's from my same province. I know him very well. But actually, they are the one who is blocking the service for the public. When we went there to start in pay some assistance in in fact, a PhD graduate from Pakistan was trying to establish a lab in Afghanistan for advanced medical testing. He was forced to leave and not to work in Afghanistan. That Doctor, is what the reality is. But I'm coming to the point. There are a lot of avenues that we can do better. For example, there are a lot of Afghan medical professionals here in the United States who are not licensed. They are willing to go back to work. If we can just do a little bit, sidetrack for them, train them for a little while, take them back to Afghanistan, they can serve the country very well. They know the English, they, they, they know the culture, they know the medicine here in this country. They can serve a lot, not only for treating, but also for teaching. The second issue is that there is a lot of foundation that needs to be built. Right now, Afghanistan medical service is not based on the government capacity. And what I'm always 
deal this stuff with, the news that when you talk to somebody, you say, hey, the government doesn't have the capacity, but the NGO does. What is the NGO? That is destroying a country's foundation. That's what we, Western, took to the Afghanistan or to other countries to really destroy the foundation of the country itself. So what we really need to do is to, instead of the supporting these NGOs, to give the capacity and the possibility to the ministry itself, because that can sustain. So, for example, establishing of some public health school, that the very basic understanding of public health is not there. So I'm very optimistic about what you have done and what we could do, but optimism is not enough. We need to kind of like look at that country in a little bit different avenue. We have too many kind of associations in America. None of them can do anything in Afghanistan. Doctor, because I'm going to thank you for your comments. And just in the interest, we have some other folks who'd like to pose questions as well. So, Paul, I'm sure you'd be willing to stay around for a few minutes if there are some of these bigger issues, you know, we can discuss afterwards, but maybe in a smaller conversation. Okay. So, um, another question, please. I'm uh, Dr. Donald Thompson from George Mason University. Dr. Dobronsky, thank you for your encouraging presentation and for your uh, your vision and leadership and advocacy over the last eight years on this, on this uh, important issue. I am a medical doctor and, and uh, spent uh, a little over a year in Afghanistan as the command surgeon of the two senior uh, DOD commands from March of six to April of seven and spent uh, many wonderful hours in Dr. Fatimi's office and walking the halls of Rabia Bulki and Malalai Women's Hospital with him. Um, and had the pleasure of, uh, of helping to uh, implement the burn prevention program that you discussed. Got that, uh, got that going, found the right NGO to implement, and I'm still helping them with that. Um, based on, on what happened then, the challenges that, that we had with finding resources to go to, to solutions that actually build capacity in the Afghan government to manage and deliver health care for their own population, um, is there or should there be a leading and coordinating champion at the U.S. government level that would help synchronize, help facilitate the interests that we've heard from, for, for instance, the Abbott Foundation, the, uh, the gentleman's comments about uh, Afghan physicians who would like to go back, but such uh, interest from outside government on these broad health sector reconstruction and development activities that actually develop sustainable capacity. So that's one question. And the second half of this is, Given the current security challenges, is there a, a uh, partnering mechanism, uh, a civil military partnering mechanism with uh, the Defense Department and with the NATO forces there that might allow more health development to take place in insecure areas and perhaps lead to some stability and security in those areas? Thanks. Thank Let's take one more question right, right behind you. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Fallon. I am not with any professional organization, but I have had the uh, good fortune to spend some time in Afghanistan as a spouse of the former Central Commander. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks and certainly for the encouraging statistics. And of course, there is still much work to be done. Um, I heard a comment the other day on NPR, and I was just wondering if you could comment on it, and that was suggesting that the uh, uh, drugs are being used more widely now by the women in Afghanistan and the problems that that will present uh, and is there an outreach program to educate the women in Afghanistan about the um, downfall of this? All very good questions. By the way, there were two other questions. If you'd like to ask, why don't, uh, okay. should I take them? And yes, then please, go right ahead. You, okay. I think maybe you've seen them. All right, then, or, I have the gentleman there and I think you had, so. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Hallman from the uh, Center for Disaster and Humanitarian Assistance Medicine. We provide direct uh, financial support to Malawi Hospital as well as to Kabul Medical University. And I just want to make a couple of quick comments to, which I hope you'll find encouraging in relation to the previous question. The uh, current chancellor of Kabul Medical University is actively promoting enrolling more women. Over a third of the several incoming uh, last medical school classes are women. About 50% of the incoming nursing class is women, and the target is to get that up to about 70 or 75%. So at least at Kabul Medical University, I think there is some very encouraging oh. news. Things are going in the right direction there. Did you hear that? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for adding that. And you had one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Camila Castellanos from the Random Group. 
and um, I apologize if you covered this already. I might have missed it. Um, but I'm just curious about the Xi family law that has been discussed so much in the news lately. I think it's been pretty controversial and um, much has been said about it. And um, I don't know if the Afghan Women's Council, I guess it would have a position on it and if there's anything being done about it. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, on the, let's begin with the um, first, the, the gentleman uh, who was talking about um, uh, you know, the association, establishing, and what I heard you say in a way was uh, trying to establish a type of maybe medical core, uh, uh, you know, and also looking at building capacity of the ministry. I have two comments. First of all, I think those are very good ideas and suggestions. Um, Dr. Fatemi, I believe, is coming to the United States, one. Two, you have people here in this audience who are in the U.S. government uh, uh, now at the State Department, at USAID, and at the Department of Health and Human Services. And they all heard your, your comments, uh, your proposal. Um, it would seem to me that, you know, uh, uh, I know that when we sat down with him, we discussed a range of ideas with him. The challenge is, is where you begin and how do you do it all? It, you certainly, I, 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 I think that uh, it's, it's, there's a lot to be done here. Um, I think the proposals, as I said, my own view and comment to you is, I think uh, having a cadre uh, of you know, those uh, from and throughout the United States tapped into for their expertise, um, I think makes sense. Uh, Charlie mentioned there's a lot more being done also with telemedicine and in which, by the way, you don't even have to necessarily go there and where that could be really established. So I would hope um, from uh, those of uh, some of my former colleagues who are here, I hope that that will be presented to uh, Dr. Fatemi. I think, it's, I think it's a good suggestion, a very good suggestion, and no less uh, that our governmental institutions look at it per se. Your point about also the um, uh, ministry is, I think, a key one, and that is that the ministry has to be uh, ultimately empowered. Um, uh, I think that that's what they're desirous of. I think that it's evolving. I think for sustainability, that's you know, absolutely essential, and I think that's a goal and an objective. And I think that's what um, we are trying to do um, governmentally through the various packages which uh, have sought to empower the ministry in this regard. In fact, I believe that uh, the ministry is uh, one of the first ministries actually that has been given direct uh, resources. The answer is yes to that. So uh, very good points and I'm glad you used this occasion to say it because there are many in this room I think that uh, could help with that. Uh, and your ideas. Um, second is um, uh, uh, the question about, uh, you know, uh, a coordinator. Let's see, we're yours, uh, uh, a coordinator. Um, uh, in this regard, well, that was the first, uh, about whether or not uh, should there be a type of coordinator. Um, I know in the last administration there, 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 there was. I genuinely, I don't know um, uh, if there is in the specific sense of the term, meaning located in the Bureau. In the Bureau at the State Department, there's always been traditionally, separate from our ambassador and separate from you know other interlocutors, one person who was very engaged uh, in the Bureau of, um, uh, as it's SCA, you know, um, South uh, uh, Central Asian Affairs. Having said that, your question, though, links with you know, the previous question from uh, our colleague from DOD uh, over here, because we have a special envoy, uh, Richard Holbrook, and in his role, you know, it seems to me there are a lot of pieces that would be coming together. My own view is I think it does help and it does um, uh, make sense because there are so many different aspects of providing assistance and you have different agencies. USAID does a tremendous amount of work uh, in this area. Then you have the work that's undertaken by the Bureau itself. Then you have the work of DOD, of which you were part and others here in this room have been part. Um, and I could go on, Health and Human Services, CDC. 
there are a lot of components. So in that sense, it does, my view, personal view is, it does make sense having, having a kind of coordinative role. I'm not sure whether specifically the mandate of the envoy is the one for that, because it probably makes sense having somebody who really devotes you know, full amount of time to it alone. There was that position. I, I hope that that's still uh, the, um, uh, the case. The other part of your question was about civil military, you know, and about, um, uh, uh, you know, as a, as, you know, does it work and is that an area to be advanced? Um, I will say uh, uh, yes for those that are desirous of doing it. Um, because let me give an example. This is a little bit different. I remember at the time of the military operation in uh, Mazar i Sharif and after it was over uh, in 2000. One, um, I remember that um, uh, actually UNICEF was in the process of trying to immunize different communities. And actually the U.S. government was a bit of a bridge between UNICEF, which wants to maintain its own independence in its immunization campaign, and then at the same time the kind of coordination that had to exist with the military but yet being divorced from. Um, I think there are ways of doing that and also uh, where the independence of either NGOs or international organizations are not compromised. And let me give one. Uh, we, when we were in Bamiyan, I have to say I was very impressed. New Zealand is uh, in charge of the uh, provincial reconstruction team in Bamiyan. Um, they really uh, made a very strong uh, case and appeal in ensuring that they provided information to NGOs um, and others working there but at the same time, distance, so that they could do their work and not be uh, encumbered in any way or compromised by not having you know, a, a direct tie or affiliation if that was the desire of the organization. And it has worked, and I think Bamiyan is a good example of that. But let me add, for those of you who may not know, the governor of Bamiyan is um, uh, Governor Sarabi, and um, as one, I believe, the first governor, um, of, uh, of Bamiyan and, uh, and also the first female governor, she's quite a taskmaster. She really has a very robust agenda and I think she's done a good job in really focusing all the interlocutors on the ground as to what she wants and that has helped as well. Um, the last uh, on yours, uh, in terms of the uh, family law, um, let me say that, uh, 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 you know, in terms of the past and a discussion uh, in the present, the Council just met just its subcommittee on health. And it doesn't take positions, okay? But I could tell you that, yes, this has been, in fact, uh, an important discussion. In fact, um, the um, Woodrow Wilson Center uh, Dr. Esfendiari, uh, who you may know, she uh, put a publication together that focused on laws in um, uh, Muslim societies, and one of the areas was devoted to this. When we held one of our U.S. Afghan Women's Council meetings, do you know that everyone on the Afghan side said, please, please, we want this translated in Dari, Pashtu, and in fact, that's one of the things we did do as a collaborative effort. So yes, it has been discussed. Yes, the way that uh, the, the council was looking at it was in a comparative way. Uh, and thirdly, right now, the council, you may have missed uh, earlier, is uh, in Georgetown University's hands, and I'm sure uh, these will be issues that uh, uh, they will definitely have uh, discussion, continued discussion on. And thank you for that. Yeah, one, 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 one last question. Sure. Last question. Yeah, we'll take please. the last yeah, one. Last question. <laughs> These are all have been great questions and I comments. Was there oh, 20 I, years ago I, when I, you I, were. I, huh? I apologize. I didn't answer your question, and I will come back to it. But no, go ahead, please. Okay. <laughs> I apologize for that. I was in uh, 1987, 1989 my heavy Russian accent. When you happily engage in Georgetown, I was there, so witness uh, bloodshed and all that stuff. What do you think when you are as a diplomat and uh, expert in this area, um, 
Russia will be cooperating partner or, or, or burden for U.S. smart power over there? Okay. Let oh, me oh, come to. Let yes. me come to. I'll, I'll answer. And what what you heard about Bagram Air Base? And. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know what have you heard about Bob Ryan. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, that one I don't know. But let me, I apologize. I, I skipped over yours. You know, I was looking at my notes, and I can't, uh, my writing's too small for myself. Uh, um, your question is a, is a very good one about uh, drugs. Um, whether statistically it's gone up for women, I genuinely, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that, yes, uh, women have been users. Um, uh, many in the rural areas. Um, uh, I think that uh, it's related to a number of factors, part of which is you have the real challenge of getting alternative livelihoods, so changing it completely throughout Afghanistan, um, and livelihoods and, and crops that, uh, as it has been said, will um, uh, uh, outcompete um, uh, in terms of the income that's coming in. Uh, it's been very challenging for many rural areas. Secondly, the woman who mentioned earlier in the session about mental health, you have many women who have said that they have turned uh, to this because just of, you know, to, 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 to lose themselves. Um, so it is a key issue, it's a key area. It's one in which uh, the United States government has focused on extensively um, and over administrations. And even so much so, a number of you may have seen, I know that there have been a number of people who have looked at what has happened in Colombia, looking at lessons learned, how maybe what has been done in Colombia could be also applicable in some parts to Afghanistan, also, the United Nations has been very, very focused on this, um, uh, no less the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, as well as the White House Office of uh, Drug uh, Control and Enforcement. Um, uh, the issue is, is how the challenges, especially of, uh, as I've mentioned, the types of trade-offs um, uh, in this regard are addressed because that's been one of one among a number of issues. Another issue is, of course, um, uh, uh, lawlessness that exists in uh, different uh, uh, communities uh, in, and in rural areas, which uh, this has brought in a lot of income. Uh, and so women have been very much affected by that. Um, uh, sir, in terms of, of your uh, question uh, about um, uh, uh, Russia, I, I will tell you, honestly, um, uh, we have collaborated with uh, a wide variety of, of countries uh, in Afghanistan on uh, many, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, humanitarian uh, issues and areas. Uh, I know that during my tenure in government, uh, uh, you know, there are times we had um, uh, discussions uh, very broadly about uh, global issues and uh, the neighborhood. Um, but I'm not, I will tell you honestly, I'm not familiar with uh, programs uh, that uh, may or, or may not exist uh, on the ground uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, there are a lot uh, of, uh, of countries that uh, have invested uh, monies. I, I mentioned um, New Zealand, not only in the sense of their military, uh, but it's striking to me, uh, actually, uh, they feel ownership of Bamiyan province. Uh, and have done a lot. The Prime Minister of New Zealand has done a lot. Um, uh, there have been a number of, uh, of, of countries and interlocutors. I would say that more it has been in the vein of discussing the area, stability, um, uh, as I said, the neighborhood uh, in that context. So thank you. Thanks very much. Paula, thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, Participants, thank all of you. I, I apologize that our air circulation system is not working quite up to par here this afternoon, <laughs> but I think it's a sign of your devotion to the issue that you all stuck with it. So thank you very well, much I was for that. I say a special yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> and thank you to Paula, please.